So we're continuing on in our study through Ephesians. So we're at Ephesians 4 and we're at Ephesians 5. So just a quick review, you know, in Ephesians 1, Paul writes about this incredible spiritual blessing that every believer possesses. Now, uh, just because you have a blessing doesn't mean you feel it, but this, this incredible blessing is awaiting those uh, who seek after it. So every believer has this incredible spiritual blessing that Paul says is greater than any blessing the world has to offer. So Paul says, you know, give praise to God. And then Paul says in chapter 2, you know, uh, God brought people that were far apart together closer to him and closer to each other, which is actually the incredible wisdom that God created and a mystery that God declared through Paul now that he preaches to the world that Jews and Gentiles are now bound together by the blood of Jesus. And within this church, uh, within this church is the place now where you can actually experience how high and wide and deep and long is the great love of God. So, you know, can you experience the love of God outside the church? Yes. But can you experience the fullness and the depths and the glories of God's love? Where can you do it? And what Paul is saying is the best way to do it is inside the church because that's one of the blessings that God wants to give is for us to experience deeply his love. Now, in chapter 4, Paul says, in light of all of these blessings that God has given to us, Paul now calls us to a worthy life. He says, live a life that matters. He says, live a life for eternity. He says, live a life where, you know, uh, you, can, you can hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. So, you know, two weeks ago, we talked about one key aspect of this worthy life is you have to be part of the body of Christ, not just an attender, um, not just a consumer, but someone who is relationally committed to the body and someone who serves the body. So, you know, as an attender or a consumer, you know, attenders, they come, but they're not relationally committed. And consumers, they come. They may actually be relationally committed, but they're not giving or serving uh, in the name of Jesus. So Paul says, if you really want to grow, if you, if you don't want the body to become corrupt and rotten, but you really want to grow, then the members of the body, because of the blessings that they have received from God, must now be relationally committed to each other and now must serve one another and be aware of the danger and the excuse of just being an attender or just being a consumer or a receiver. Now, that's the genuine expression and the characteristic of someone that has been really touched and changed and transformed by the grace of God. So now we come to chapter, uh, the middle of chapter 4, and we come to uh, just, you know, the middle of chapter 5. And basically what Paul says is this, is he says, a worthy life, he basically says, is a new life. Okay? A worthy life is a new life. So Paul, he makes a contrast here. He says, live a new life and stop living your old life. So he says in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, so this I say and affirm together with the Lord. So, you know, Paul's not just saying this, but he's saying this is what Jesus is saying. This is God's will for the church, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility, or it could be meaninglessness, emptiness, the worthlessness of their minds. So the way you used to live your life before you became a Christian, you need a complete overhaul. You need a complete change. What you used, the way you used to live now must be completely different. That's what Paul says. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul basically says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. So uh, you used to live like this. Stop living like that anymore. And instead, I want you to live like this. And the life that God has called you to live, it is like God. You got to be like God. You got to imitate God. Okay? So he says... This is now how you should live. So now he's getting really into the practicals. You know, like um, he talks about the blessings that we have. He talks about the creation of the church. So chapter one is all about the blessing. Chapter two and three is about the creation of the church and the blessings of the creation of the church because within the church you actually get to experience the love of God. And then chapter four and chapter five now is basically Paul saying this is how you should live your life. So now he's getting into the practicals. And then chapter six, Paul basically says, 
but as you live like this, the enemy is going to attack you and make sure that you don't live like that. So that's basically the summary of the whole book of Ephesians. So uh, how should we live? How should we live, right? Paul says, and he gets super practical, is don't steal, work really hard, and be generous. That's the first thing he says. Don't steal, work really hard, and be generous. Second thing Paul says is, hey, you really need to deal with all this bitterness and resentment and anger and hatred and unforgiveness that you have in your heart. So Paul understands that there are people who have been really hurt, and because of that, they just carry on a lot of bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and victim mentality and, you know, like all this pain. And Paul says, hey, you, you just got to, like, give that up. You got to let it go. Like, like, you can't carry that into your new life. That's basically what Paul's saying. And then, you know, Paul says, you know, uh, watch your speech, right? Uh, you know, he says, he goes on and he says, instead, um, you, you got to be, like, kind to one another, tenderhearted. You got to forgive one another. Um, he says, you got to walk in love. So, so basically, Paul says, hey, this, this old life that you used to live where you didn't trust anyone, you didn't love anyone, you hated everyone, you're, like, resentful to everyone, you only trusted a small circle, like, you held everyone off at arm's length, you just got to let that go. And instead, now, this church, this, this family of God that God has given to you, you got to be kind to one another and compassionate, and you got to forgive them, and you got to love one another. And then starting in chapter 5, verse 3, all the way to verse 14, this is actually where Paul spends the most time. He says, and you really need a new sexual ethic. Basically, Paul says, you got to stop being immoral. You got to stop committing sexual sin. He basically says, you got to stop being impure. And he spends the most time dealing with uh, the sin of sexuality. He basically says, hey, Ephesians, you guys really have to be sexually pure. Now, the reason why Paul says that is because if you know the context of Ephesus, if I could kind of describe Ephesus compared to the other cities in the ancient world, Ephesus is kind of like Las Vegas. Paul basically planted a church in Las Vegas. And, you know... Um, you know, the biggest temple in the, uh, the ancient world was the temple of Diana or Artemis, which was in Ephesus. And, you know, uh, when you look at temples or when you kind of imagine a temple, you think it's kind of like a very religious place. You know, you kind of imagine that it's kind of like a real holy place. But, you know, uh, majority of the temple practices was actually prostitution. So people went there. Uh, they drank, they ate, they worked themselves up into a frenzy, and then they found a, a, a temple prostitute, and they basically slept with them, you know? And some Ephesians temples, they basically said they were male prostitutes, and they were female prostitutes. So this was actually the normal, accepted custom of a normal Ephesian, right? Uh, sexuality was rampant. Like, if you kind of saw some statues of, you know, the gods in Ephesus, you kind of see, like, you know, uh, like, you know, nakedness. You see, like, you know, all these, like, naked parts, right? And uh, you kind of see, like, that was just considered normal. So sexuality was, like, rampant. So when someone became a Christian, and what's really crazy is in one of the most darkest places, if you look at the book of Acts, uh, there was the biggest revival that Luke talks about in the book of Acts that happened in Ephesus. So these people were touched by the grace of God. These people were, like, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, they came into the church, but literally all these people for, like, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years was living their lives in wanton sexuality. And Paul had to address that because although they were touched by God and filled with the Spirit, it wasn't that they were automatically made holy and then, you know, all the sexual sins that they struggled with was just gone but they carried some of their baggage in, like some of us do, right? They carried some of their sins in. And Paul had to really address that. Why? Because imagine how hard it must have been for a person touched by God to come into the church and to put off the practices that he was so used to that he was growing up his entire life uh, within the environment of the, you know, uh, of the city of Ephesus, right? So that's why Paul spends so much time addressing this. You know, Paul says, hey, watch your speech, 
Watch your resentment, watch your bitterness. Hey, work hard, be generous. And he says, hey, you really need to watch your sexual life because the life that you used to live, that's not the new life that God has called you to. And then Paul basically says, be holy because you met Jesus. You know, in Ephesians chapter 20, he says, you did not learn Christ in this way, not about Christ, you didn't hear from Christ, but you didn't learn Christ, like you met Christ. If indeed you heard him, not about him or of him, but you heard him. So this is like direct address. You met Christ. You heard from him directly and have been taught in him. These are like all intimate language, just as the truth is in Jesus. So Paul basically, as he calls them to a new life, he says, the life that you used to live, you can't live like that anymore because now you are in an intimate relationship with Jesus. That's basically what Paul's saying. And then he says, because, you know, like uh, when, there's a in, when there's a revival, right, Ephesus was a church that was the product of a revival, when there's a revival, like, you know, all these genuine believers come in, but also um, fake believers come in, right? So Paul says, you know, he gives a consequence. He says, hey, you know when some of you guys, you, you don't live the new life that God has called you to, you grieve the Holy Spirit. That's basically what Paul's saying. You grieve the Holy Spirit, and we're going to come back to that at the end. And then he says, not only do you grieve the Holy Spirit, but you give room for the devil to have a foothold upon your heart. You know, uh, I remember, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the quick series that we did on, you know, um, uh, Satan and the demonic. Uh, You can be a believer and a demon can have control over your heart, right? You're still owned by God, but a demon can have a control, right? And that's basically what Paul's talking about here. So, You know, because you don't live the new life that God has called you to. You have freedom to live this life or freedom not to live this life. Because you choose not to live this life, not only do you grieve the Holy Spirit, but you allow the devil to have a foothold upon your heart. You know why one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit is grieved? Because the place where only he is supposed to be at, you've allowed the devil in to share room with the Holy Spirit because of your sin because of the fact that you're not letting go of your uh, forgiveness issues, because of the fact that, you know, you're carrying resentment and bitterness and anger in your heart, because of the fact that you're not being generous but you're stealing, because of the fact that, you know, you're not being kind and, and loving to one another because you're controlled by fear and doubt, and because of the fact that you are not repenting of your sexual immorality. That's why you're grieving the Holy Spirit. The devil has a hold upon your heart, right? And not only that, but there were some people who really didn't care. They were just, you know, they were just following after the new thing, you know. Maybe, you know, uh, they were part of the church of Ephesus because, you know, for any other reason than Jesus. And Paul says in chapter 5, verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, you know what these things are? A refusal of a person to live the new life that God has called them to live. Because of the refusal of a person to live the new life that God has called them to live, the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Right? So, basically, uh, you know, Paul's in chapter 4 and chapter 5, Paul's just basically telling God's people who agree with chapter 1, 2, and 3, they agree that they've been blessed by God, they agree that God is real. They agree that they have been blessed with spiritual blessings. They agree with the creation of the church. They agree that the church is a good thing. They agree that the church is the place where they can experience the fullness and the greatness and the depth and the height and the love of God. And Paul says, if you agree with all this, then you can't continue to live the way you used to live. Instead, you have to live a new life. You have to be like God. You got to let go of your old life. You got to put on the new life and you got to live the life that is pleasing and honoring to God, right? So that's just my quick summary of chapter 4 and 5. So now we go into our question. And the question is this, right? What does your life look like? What does your life look like, especially if you confess that you are a believer today? As God has called us to a worthy life, Are you living this worthy and new life that God has called you to? Not just in your mind, 
not just in your heart, but practically in your relationships, in your decisions, in your actions, and in your outward self, right? Um, you know, by the time a person is at Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, you know, as, as they've been listening to Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3, by the time they're at Ephesians 4 and 5, the normal and natural question that a person would ask is this, now, how do I live this life? How can I live this life, right? How do I obey these commands? How do I obey these commands? And this is where I kind of want to spend the bulk of, um, uh, you know, what God's word has to say. So how do we obey these commands, right? Uh, first is this, you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. You cannot obey these commands alone by yourself. You need to be in community, okay? Uh, the only people that can live out this new life are those that are in relationship with the body of Christ and that are in serving relationship with the body of Christ, where they are serving and where they're being served. Unless you are committed to the body of Christ, this new life is practically impossible for you to live. So here at our church, unless you are committed to being part of the body of Christ, especially through our cell groups, it is practically impossible for you to live out this new life that God has called you to. You see, transformation, true transformation, right, is only possible in relationships. Why? Because Paul says that. Paul says that only in relationship can this ministry of speaking the truth in love to one another is possible, right? Only in relationship. Because without relationship, right, without close relationship, you wouldn't speak the truth and you wouldn't have love. And those are two necessary ingredients for transformation. In fact, if you sitting here today, remember, this, this whole sermon is about transformation, okay? Right? This whole sermon is about transformation. If you're sitting here today, right, and you don't have a single person speaking truth out of a loving heart to you, transformation is going to be very, very hard for you to achieve and accomplish. So what is the purpose of cell? You know, people say, well, I've been to cell, you know, and nothing happens, you know. Uh, no one changed, like, you know, like, I don't get anything. Like, I feel like I'm wasting my time. You know why? Because most likely in your heart, you don't love yourself or some people in your cell don't love you. And most likely, even if you don't, if you love each other, you are so cowardly and you are so afraid to speak the truth to one another. Right? Just, just because you're in cell doesn't mean transformation is going to happen. But the purpose of cell the idea of a small group community is this, that God has placed us together to love one another, and God has placed us together out of that love, the greatest expression, one of the greatest expression of love is speaking truth. We speak the truth to one another. Why? Because only when the body of Christ comes together and we speak the truth in love to one another, only then true transformation occurs and we can be the people that God has called us to be. Amen? You guys agree with that? Right? That's why. That's why the enemy wants you to live an isolated life. That's why the enemy is always whispering in your ear. Right? Oh, I don't belong here. No one likes me here. I feel alone here. No one understands me here. Right? I don't feel accepted here. Right? Why? Why do you hear these voices in your head? Because the enemy wants to isolate you. Why? Because the enemy cannot do anything for the battle of salvation, but the enemy can do something for the battle of fruitfulness. And the best way to make you as fruitless as possible is to isolate you from the community of God. Right? And that goes against transformation. That goes against God's will for the church. That goes against God's will for the Christian. So, how can we really live this new and worthy life that God has called us to? It's impossible unless we are in a committed relationship with at least a few people in our lives where we say to one another, where we covenant to each other and we say, hey, you speak the truth to me 
and I'll speak the truth to you, and we will love each other forever. Can I get an amen on that? Those are your real friends. Those are your real brothers. Those are your real sisters. It's not just people who say, oh, I'm here for you. I'm never going to leave you. I'll never say anything. Right? Transformation is impossible. And sometimes the church, right, we're nothing but a therapy session where all we do is just listen. You get everything off your chest, and now you feel better because everything's off your chest. And everybody's listening to you, and they're just like, oh, my God, this person's crazy. And then they look at each other. Who's going to say it? No one's going, I'm not going to say it. You say it. No, I'm not going to say it. You say it. No, I'm not going to say it. Pastor Josh will say it. Right? Pastor Joseph will say it. Right? What an immature church. Rotten church. Rotten church. Right? You know? No, we never grow up that way. Right? It's impossible. So if you've been following with us, right, and God is working in your heart, and you truly desire transformation, you want to be like Jesus, right? You don't want to walk in your old ways anymore. Let me give you an encouragement. Here's a very practical application. Find at least a couple people and say, hey, because we want to follow God together, let's speak the truth and love to one another. Amen? It's tough, amen, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's only possible through, it's only possible in committed relationships. That's why, that's one of the reasons why the church is here, so that we'll be transformed, right? But according to Paul, here's his main point. In chapter 4, um, verse 22 and 20, 22 to 24, Paul says, this is the key to transformation, okay? So this, Paul, you know, if you look at chapter 4 and 5, majority of it is Paul saying, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. That's basically what Paul's saying, majority of it. You know, he goes, uh, say this, don't say this. Do this, don't do this. Have this attitude, don't have this attitude. Make sure your heart is like this. Make sure your heart is not like this. And then... Paul brings it all together, and he says, this is how you do it, right? So, so uh, if I could kind of like, you know, uh, summarize it, this is the key to transformation. If you can get this right, and if you can apply this into your life in a healthy community, right, in a healthy co co uh, committed community, right, if you can apply this and you're in community, most likely over a period of time, your life will be transformed, okay? That's basically what Paul's saying, okay? So, and remember, remember who Paul's talking to. He's talking to some of the most wretched, corrupt, depraved people that God's grace touched and brought into his kingdom, <laughs> right? You know, some people were saying some of these cult temple prostitutes were touched by the grace of God and they were brought into the church of Ephesus, right? So, you know, Paul's talking about people that, like, you know, that they had a crazy past. And Paul's like, if you do this, then your past, your, your present will look nothing like your past. That's basically what Paul's saying, right? So, what does that mean? Well, let me first read it for us. Uh, verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Okay, so what does this mean? Basically, this word put off and put on back in these days was part of the baptismal formula. So this was actually the language that people used, the churches and the leaders, the apostles and the pastors used before a person became baptized. So, you know, uh, when a person became baptized, they used to say, you are going from death to life. You are being buried and raised again, and you are now putting off and putting on. 
So the context of putting off and putting on is within baptism. Okay? Now, if you remember kind of a quick teaching on baptism, baptism is like a wedding ceremony. It's basically a ceremony and a celebration for all to see that your relationship has changed. You guys see that? Right? Because why do we go to weddings? Why do we go to weddings? Right? You know, the main purpose of a wedding is what? There's two things. Number one, we rejoice in the fact that God brought two people together and made them one. But it's also a declaration to all of our friends and our family and all those that join us that my relationship status has changed. I have gone from a single person to now a married person. That's basically what weddings are. So when you go through a baptism, this is why baptism is so important, and this is why you do it publicly in front of all people, you're basically declaring to the world, everybody who knows you, that your relationship status has changed. You are not in relationship with God. Now you are in relationship with God. Okay? But here's the thing. The change is so drastic. The change is so radical. The change is so dramatic. It takes time for that person to realize how much change has happened in that person's life. Um, you know, I was doing a little bit of research, and I Googled, I said, you know, uh, what is the most drastic citizenship change between two countries? I actually Googled that, and then the answer was from Australia to Indonesia. That's basically what the answer was. And they said, when you look at these two countries, it is so drastically different it takes, it, it says a person transferring their citizenship from Australia to Indonesia or from Indonesia to Australia will have the hardest time uh, really coming to acceptance of their new relationship status. And if it's that hard, what I want to let you know is this. You changing your relationship status with sin to Jesus now is even greater and more radical and more broader than a, cit a person changing their citizenship from Australia to now Indonesia, right? But not only that, as you see that it's all about a relationship status that has been changed, this is basically what you're saying as you put off and as you put on. You are looking at sin. You are looking at Satan. You are looking at any evil force that's trying to stop you from living this life, and basically what you're saying is this. You, by the virtue of your confession in Jesus, you're saying, I have broken up with sin. I have divorced sin. I have gotten together with Jesus, and I have married Jesus, and not only are you doing that, but, you know, uh, if we were living in the modern world, you are celebrating it, you have a ceremony about it, and you make it Facebook official. Can I get an amen on that? Right? So what I want to let you know is this, and this is, I'm just following the Apostle Paul, okay? You want true transformation in your life? You really want to be able to live out all that God commands in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5? Do you want the chains of sin to be broken? Guess what? You need to understand and you need to confess that you have broken up with sin, you have divorced Satan, you have gotten together with Jesus, and you have married Jesus. Can I get amen on that? And let me ask you a question. When something this dramatic and when something this crazy happens, do you keep it privately to yourself or do you declare it to the whole world? Right? Can you imagine if you say to your fiance, hey, let's get married, but quietly, secretly, behind the back, just you and me so that no one will know. You think your fiance would want to marry you? And if she does, you guys have massive problems in your relationship and you need marriage counseling, right? No, what do you do? You make it public. You celebrate it. You declare it. Right? And that's what Paul means by saying, put off and put on. Now, here's the problem. The problem is if you look at this text, as you lay aside your old self, the deceitful, lustful desires are fighting you every step of the way. In the Greek, this is actually a present tense. 
which means it is not stopping, it is continuing. So, so recap, you broke up with sin. You looked at sin and said, we're gonna break up now. I can't be with you anymore, <laughs> right? You divorce Satan. You serve Satan divorce papers and say, hey, we need to break this relationship. I'm done with you. And then you turned around and you married Jesus and you got together with Jesus and you made that Facebook official, right? Now, you would think it's all over, right? It's all good, everything's good. There's no problems. But here's the problem. There's these deceitful, lustful desires that are fighting you every step of the way. So as you gave up your citizenship to Australia and you became a citizen of Indonesia, as you broke up with Satan and as you divorced sin and now you've gotten together with Jesus, guess what uh, the enemy is doing? They're secretly sending you emails offering better deals they're DMing you and asking you to come back. They still have feelings for you. They want you back. They can't believe you left them. They're going to fight for you, and they're not going to let you go easy. Right? So what do they do? They follow you. They call you. They say bad about your current significant other who's Jesus. They seem to bump into you way too often. They, rem they reminisce with you about the good old days you guys used to have. They refuse to move on. They have extreme emotions towards you. They hate you and they love you at the same time. And they tell you outright secretly all the time that they miss you. Do you feel that sometimes? Do you feel that sometimes? If not, good for you. This is, where the, this is where every Christian is at. Sin and Satan is secretly DMing them. Now the question is, will you fight, fight back by remembering your new relationship status? You have two options. You have two options. Number one, you get a secret email. You get an unknown text. Someone DMs you. That's the right word, right, DM? Okay. Okay, I had to Google that one, right? Someone DMs you, right? Right? You could say, hey, stop texting me. We're done, you and I. It's over, right? We broke up. I divorced you. I'm married now. Stop texting me. Stop DMing me. Stop secretly emailing me. That could be one response. Or the second response is this or you could secretly date sin behind Jesus' back. That's the problem. And some of you, you are secretly dating sin behind Jesus' back. You are committing spiritual adultery. That's why there's no transformation. The Apostle Paul says transformation is impossible without completely putting off the old and completely putting on the new. This is a relationship status language, which means what? Transformation is impossible unless you completely, wholeheartedly, decisively break with sin and Satan in your life. You must not have any relationship with them, right? And you must wholeheartedly now go into the love relationship that you have committed with Jesus. And Paul says, that's the key to transformation, right? You know why? Because here's the problem. It's very possible to, quote, live your new life in Christ without fully taking off the old. Right? Oh, yeah, you and me, we're dating. Oh, yeah, you and me, we're married. But can I still, can I go have dinner with my ex? Can I still, you know, go on a weekend trip with my ex-girlfriend? I mean, hey, hey, I'm committed to you. I love you. You know I see you every Sunday at 1.15. But can I, can I go on this quick trip with my ex? It's, I mean, I, you can trust me, right? Look how stupid that sounds. But that's what we're doing. Why? Because we don't obey the simple command that God has given to us by completely putting off the old. You know, I see some people in the church, and they do all these religious things, 
but they have not decisively, completely, wholeheartedly broken up with sin and Satan in their lives. So you still have the old, you just cover it with the new. This one pastor, he said it like this, he said, you never take off your old poopy diaper, you just put a new one over it. So even though you look good, you smell rotten. That's why we never get transformed. That's why you come to church 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, and nothing happens to you. Right? Nothing happens to you. Because you have not made that complete break with sin. When was the last time you told sin, I'm done with you? We're broke. We we're broke. <laughs> and we are broke. <laughs> we broke up. Right? You know, um, let me digress a little bit, okay? Um, guys, I think I've said this four times already. Do not marry anyone who is not committed to Jesus, okay? Because before you marry them, they're already married. You understand what I'm saying? They're married to Jesus, right? Before you marry them, they're already married to Jesus. So when you marry them, it's nothing but a second marriage. You're just entering into a second marriage, okay? They're already married. They're married to Jesus. So you get to see their marriage and see what your marriage is going to be like. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? Right? You see their marriage. You see what their marriage to Jesus is like. You're watching them. Right? Are they secretly dating behind Jesus? If they're secretly dating behind Jesus' back, what makes you think they're not going to secretly date behind your back? Because you're prettier? Do you make more money? Because you're more awesomer than Jesus? Awesome? Right, like, you know what I'm saying? Don't be blind. Don't be blind. Right? If they can't make their marriage with Jesus right, what makes you think that they're going to make your marriage with Jesus right? I mean, your marriage with them right. Right? You know, all of you guys, you're doing nothing but stepping into a second marriage. Makes sense, right? Right? So this is why. This is why, right? You know, you know those people who are like, oh, I don't know what marriage is like, you know? I, I, everybody's married. Actually, not everybody. If you're a Christian, you're married. So you get to see. You get to see them. You get to see how they conduct their marriage with Jesus. You get to see if they're, like, really broke up with sin. You get to see if they really divorce Satan. You get to see if they're wholeheartedly committed to Jesus. And as you see that, you have confidence now. Man, if I marry that guy, if I marry that girl, the way they conduct their marriage with Jesus is the way they'll conduct their marriage with me. So I have great peace. Now I know what I'm stepping into, and I know that I'm going to have a good marriage because they've had previous great marriages before. Can I get an amen on that? Right? You guys see that? Go back to my point now. So, how do I go deeper into Jesus? How can I truly be transformed? How can I really take off the old? You need to have the courage to break up. You need to divorce. Some of you, you have not really broken up. Some of you have not divorced sin and Satan. You need to stop following them on Facebook. You need to stop following them on Instagram. You need to stop being around them. You need to stop talking to them. You need to stop thinking about them. And you need to go deeper into the new relationship you have with Jesus. Historically, the, tradition, the church used to call that fasting. Fasting. Right? And we don't do that anymore. Right? You know why old school saints used to fast? Because one of the expressions was, it was their way of saying, I broke up with you. I'm done with you. 
I don't want you to tempt me and lead me astray because now I'm committed to a new relationship. Maybe what some of you need to do is to fast. But here's the second application. You guys heard, you are what you do, right? You are what you do, right? We say that all the time, you are what you do. Um, The Bible also affirms you become what you do. You become what you do. So through your actions, through your obedience, through your practices, you can become the person that God has called you to be. So the more we practice these virtues of the Christian life, what Paul listed in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, the deeper we go into our relationship with Jesus. Ephesians 5 teaches us that through obedience, you can actually become more like Jesus. You know, um, it's so interesting because I hope you know Scripture is a tension, right? Uh, Scripture is radical middle, right? Uh, The Apostle Paul says that we are saved by grace, right, not by works. But you know what the Apostle Paul says? He says we become more like Jesus through our works. He says our relationship with Jesus becomes deeper through our works. You know, the most shocking thing I found the Apostle Paul say here in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 is this, right? Um, Well, I'll phrase it with the question. Who wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Who wants to be? It's a stupid question, right? Right? Of course, all of us, right? Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Can Can I get amen? You guys want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? You guys, have you guys ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? Right? Like, you know, I, I, I don't mean like, you know, like one of those like ecstatic, like crazy experiences where you're like laid out on the ground. I mean, that's, that's awesome, by the way. But being filled with the Holy Spirit is, the best, best way to describe it is this incredible joy and peace and freedom and lightness and comfort and blessing that just overwhelms your soul to a point where you just want to smile and laugh and cry and weep and like, you know, like you just, best thing to describe it is the greatest feeling in the world. And the Apostle Paul, he commands you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 5.18. That's basically what he's saying. He says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you guys, but every time I read that, I asked myself, what does that mean? How can one be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, you know, it just doesn't sound practical, right? Like, what am I supposed to do? You know, and I've heard some pastors say, oh, you just gotta, you just gotta believe. You know, that never, I don't know, the way my brain works, that just never flies for me. Like, when someone just goes, just do it, I don't know, I don't know right? My first, next thought is, can't listen to that guy anymore, right? And I always wondered about that, and I started studying chapters four and five, I started studying what it means to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And, you know, this, this is how you become filled by the Holy Spirit, okay? Number one, it's God's mysterious will, okay? Holy Spirit wants to fill you. He's going to fill you whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, right? You know, Holy Spirit, he goes to and fro, wherever he wants, doing whatever he wants, and nothing can stop him. So that's, that's number one, God's mysterious will. So Holy Spirit wants to come and fill us right now? Praise God right? There's nothing we can do, right? So that's one. That's generally the most common way that he works, right? Uh, You know, we don't force him to do anything. He does what he wants to do. Number two, though, right? Uh, Through prayer. We become filled with the Holy Spirit through prayer. Uh, Us praying on our own, someone else praying for us, right? You know, uh, there's times where someone lays hands on you and then you become filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Or, or like, you're like you're having a time of prayer and then the Holy Spirit uses that to come and fill you. So, so it's prayer. And that's very common too, right? I, you know, that's kind of how God works. Number three, uh, consecration, consecration. So you become filled with the Holy Spirit when, you know, you, you, you consecrate yourself. You know, like, you know, you're like, you're like God, I, I, I fast and I give this up and I give this to you, Lord. I, I, I consecrate the next 30 days in prayer and fasting. I consecrate the next 30 days in devotion to you. And, and usually through consecration, uh, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and you become filled, right? So, so, you know, most churches, 
That's kind of how they understand the filling of the Holy Spirit, right? It's, you know, uh, you know God's mysterious will, prayer, and consecration. I mean, that's where, I, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the majority of things that I hear about. That's kind of how people go about, you know, wanting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and that's my encouragement to you. You should do that, right? Like, pray for one another. Pray for yourself, you know? Uh, consecrate yourself. Fast. Seek God. Worship. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? But you know what Paul says here in Ephesians chapter 5 when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit? If the context serves me correctly, and we are not theologizing this, but we are looking at this passage directly from its direct text using the proper evangelical hermeneutic called exegesis. What Paul is saying here is, you become filled with the Holy Spirit through obedience. When you obey, the Holy Spirit fills you. And through the filling of the Holy Spirit, you become transformed. You know, people, there's people who go around, you know, they're like, you know, spirit junkies, right? They go one revival, another revival, all they want to do is be prayed for, pray for, pray for, pray for, pray for, and they don't care about obedience a single moment in their lives. What the Holy Spirit says here is, you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Then obey the words of God. And through the obedience of God's people, breaking up with sin, fully pursuing Jesus, you become filled with the Holy Spirit, and then your life gets transformed. You know, uh, <clears throat> I had a... I had a speaking engagement, and, uh, you know, um, this church asked me to come speak and share God's word. So I went there, and, you know, I had a really good time. You know, um, I was blessed. I don't know if they were blessed, but I was blessed. And, uh, you know, and usually when you go speak, you know, um, you know, they, get, they, you know, like, uh, you get paid. So, you know, you get this thing called an honorarium. So, you know, um, you know, pastor gave me an honorarium. I looked inside, and it was way more than I expected. And my first thought was, thank you, Jesus. And I was driving back, and, uh, you know, you know, you hear the Holy Spirit speak, right? And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, give it all to me. He said, give it all to me. And uh, I was like, Huh, did I hear that right? You know? And, uh, yeah, you know, you know when God speaks. And, you know, you go through a wide range of emotions, and then finally, I was like, okay. So I literally just stopped my car, because, you know, you gotta just do it right at the moment, because something's gonna get in the way, right? And I pulled over, you know, just kind of, gave it all to Jesus. And I got back in my car and started driving, and I kid you not, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I felt this incredible joy, this incredible peace, this incredible freedom, this incredible I can't even describe it. Words do not do justice. And it lasted like, like a minute. And afterwards, I said to myself, I would have paid more to experience something like that. You see, I've experienced the Holy Spirit when someone prayed over me. I've experienced the Holy Spirit when I pray for myself. I've experienced the Holy Spirit when I was just walking and then the Spirit just decided to zap me. But I also got the joy of experiencing the Holy Spirit through my obedience. Now, I'm not saying it happens all the time. But the fact that it could happen now gives me joy. 
Now gives me motivation. Now gives me, I don't know, uh, encouragement to obey the commands of God. And that transforms me to be more like Jesus. So I want to encourage you today. Do you want to be transformed? Do you really want to be changed? Do you really want to live this new life that God has given to you? It starts with you being filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? That's the command. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean in this context? It means pursue obedience with all your heart. Which is what? Put off your old. Make a decisive break with sin. And put on the new. Pursue after your relationship with Jesus with all your heart. Amen? Yeah. You know, as I invite the praise team up, um, I want to encourage you tonight, today. Um, I want you to put off the old. You know, sometimes just because we know it and we feel it, we don't say it. I remember this one pastor, he, he said, um, he said, I pulled up two chairs. He said, I put the chairs, he, he said, uh, I, put an, I, put, I sat down on one chair and I put a chair another, uh, in front of me and, and that chair was for the devil. That's basically what he said. He said, that chair was for the devil. And he said, I sat down and I looked at the devil and he said, he said to the devil, he said, it's over between you and me. We're done. I know who you are. And I don't trust you. I don't care what you say to me. You hurt me enough. It's over between us. Right? And, you know, when I first heard it, I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, that's what it should be like. Like, you don't break up secretly. That's cowardly. Right? You, you break up face to face. Right? You break up. Now, you know, you, you got to have integrity when you break up. You know? You can't do it through email or text or, you know? Like, no, you, you say, hey, it's over between us. Right? Let's not see each other anymore. Let's go live our separate lives. Right? And I wonder if you ever did that to sin. I wonder if you ever did that to the devil. Right? Or did you just send the devil a text? Or did you just, all of a sudden, just decide to ignore him? Right? No, you need to break up. So today, as we come before God, I want you to break up with sin. I want you to break up with the devil. And then I want you to put on the new. I want you to turn to Jesus. I want you to picture him in your mind. And I want you to say, I commit my life to you. And I want you to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And I want you to do that every day. And then as you obey the commands of God, the Holy Spirit will now come. Why? Because he's not grieved anymore. He's not grieved anymore. And when he's not grieved, he fills. And through your obedience, may you experience the sweet, pleasing, blessed, comforting, peaceful, free blessing that the Holy Spirit wants to pour out upon you. This is how we're transformed. This is how the church becomes to, begins to look more like Jesus. And that's my prayer. That's my prayer for us, is that we become more like Jesus. So let me pray for us. And after that, let's go into this time. So let's all rise together. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today. God, our relationship status has changed. 
we are no longer in relationship with sin and we are no longer in relationship with Satan. We have broken up. We have divorced. Now we are married to you. Now we are committed to you. So help us to get rid of our old ways because that doesn't fit the new relationship that we have. But help us to live the new life that you've called us to. For God, when we live this new life and we obey your commands, we become filled with the Holy Spirit and we get to experience the joy of what it means to be in union with you. And I pray, Father, send your Holy Spirit here today that you would fill my brothers and sisters here. So Holy Spirit, come in your mercy and love and grace and come and fill us as we commit our lives to you, as we break up with sin, as we worship you. Holy Spirit, come and fill your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.